able to be successful in business enough that I can take care of my children and provide them with the lifestyle that I want them to provide uh, without worries. This state has been tremendous. With that, my parents have always taught us the importance of giving back to the state. So you took half my speech, Derek. <laughs> giving back to the state. My father, anytime a, a charity asked him to either come speak at there or to, to give some type of memorabilia, he always did. He understood it was important to give back to the community. My mother, she spent most of her adult life working with handicapped children, primarily the hard of hearing children. Uh, I, my wife and I are on numerous boards uh, from Hope for Prisoners, the Tark Toy Drive, and so forth. But you know what really caught my attention and my interest was when I was in college and I watched statesmen like uh, at that time Governor um, uh, Governor Laxalt and state then U.S. Senator uh, Paul Laxalt. I watched the statesmen of what he was. You know, and I don't use it as a politician because you see so many politicians now. When when Senator Laxalt said something, you can trust that he was going to do what he said. Uh, he didn't campaign on one thing and then do something else. What he did was he made you proud that he represented you and proud of our, of our public servants. It frustrates me today to see so many of our public servants that uh, will do and say anything to maintain the power and prestige they have in their office so they can remain in Washington, D.C. They go out and they campaign and they promise you one thing. And when they uh, go back to Washington, D.C., they do the exact opposite. My father always taught me the worst thing you can be in life is a phony. He said, if, even if you're successful but you're a phony, how can you look in the mirror and be proud of what you've accomplished? He said, if you're honest and you're true to yourself and you may not succeed in some of your endeavors, you should be proud of what you did because you were honest and true and you weren't a phony. And that's always stood out to me. And that's why it's so frustrating to watch what's going on with so many of the politicians today. If I'm so fortunate to represent you in Washington, D.C., this is what you're going to get from me. I have true convictions for my um, public ideology, the government. I believe strongly in President Trump's America First policies and the conservative issues that have made our country so great. I, I believe strongly that we need to repeal Obamacare. And I'm not, we don't need to repeal, the, we, we need to repeal the Affordable Care Act because it's not affordable. People, hardworking middle class Amer Americans like myself and my family, We've seen our premiums increase 500%. Our deductibles have gone up 500%. Our copay has gone up 400%. Uh, this is not right that the hardworking middle class Americans have, who pay for their own insurance are being forced to, to, to burden this, uh, this cost while so many others are not paying anything for it. I believe very strongly that we should not provide citizenship to people who come in our country illegally. We are a country of a rule of laws and we've got to stand by those rule of laws. Yeah. I believe very strongly we need to secure our borders and protect what is coming in and out of our country and who's coming in and out of our country and what's coming in and out of our country. These are things all Americans should rally, rally behind. I believe very strongly that the United States should not be the world's police force. We have no business going overseas and creating wars because we don't like what one dictator or one leader of a country does or says. We should only go overseas and fight when there's an imminent threat to our national security like there was after 9-11. I believe very strongly that we shouldn't use taxpayer dollars to fund programs, that, uh, organizations that perform abortions. They should, they, 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 our tax dollars should not be going towards those fundings. So you're going to have a guy in office with strong convictions. And you're also going to have somebody in office that has the courage to fight for those convictions. You know, it's so easy to say, hey, you stand for those things, but then when the pressure comes, the mainstream media, your friends, people that you go out with, they start demonizing you because you take a certain position. How many of you have gotten those mean looks, those dirty stares when you supported Donald Trump? Right? My, my dad is a basketball coach. Uh, coached a, a player named um, Sam Smith in 1970-17, and we've done so much for Sam. Well, I came out and supported Donald Trump uh, on MSNBC recently, and he went to Facebook and called me a racist. Th these are the type of things you're faced when you stand up for your convictions. It's not easy, but it's the right thing to do. I have shown that I'll stand up for my convictions. I showed that in the 2016 election. For all of you that followed that election, which I'm sure most of you did, you saw how the mainstream media and most of the general public would demonize you if you supported Donald Trump. They made you feel embarrassed if you supported him. In fact, virtually the entire GOP leadership here in Nevada came out and, and repudiated Donald Trump. 
they tried to get me to join them. Uh, they tried, when Joe Heck and Crescent Hardy had his press conference saying that they, Donald Trump should step down as nominee, I got all kinds of pressure from people saying, you need to join them. If you don't, you're going to lose your race. You're a winner now. If you don't uh, join them, you're going to lose. They threw out the wife tra uh, factor. Think what you're going to do to your poor wife if you don't back off Trump and to lose. What you're to I said my wife would be madder, madder than hell at me if I ever even thought of that. She's stronger than I am. But you know what? I, it was an easy decision for me because I knew Donald Trump was going to be a much better president than Hillary Clinton would have been. Do any of you guys in here actually believe that Governor Sandoval, Dean Heller, Joe Heck, or Crescent Hardy thought uh, Hillary Clinton would be a better president than Donald Trump? I don't think they were thinking that. They, 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 weren't, they weren't thinking that. They, they, but they all came out and said they wouldn't support Donald Trump as president, which basically then helped Hillary Clinton win the state. You know why they did it? It was because that was the move that they thought was politically expedient. They thought that would be better to help them in their political careers at the expense of what was best for our country. And, and to me, that's what's wrong with politics. The third thing you can get from me, strong convictions, courage to stand by those convictions. I'll give you another example of courage to stand by those convictions before I go on, because we were just talking about the Yucca Mountain. In 2010, when I ran for the US Senate, I was the first candidate in, in Nevada to come out, at least in Southern Nevada, to come out and support Yucca Mountain, because I felt it was the right thing to do for our state. And if, if we have more time, we can get into all this stuff. I, I was told if you did that, it was going to end your political career, and you were going to, it, it was going to be all over. But I knew it was the right thing to do, and I was willing to take that risk and do so. Recently, I was at an event with Michael Roberson. Uh, you know Michael Roberson, our yeah, former majority leader of the state, and I ran against him in the last election, but we, you know, we're on pretty good terms now. And he came up to me at the event, and he said, Danny, I really got to admire you here. And I'm thinking to myself, what's he going to say? You know, like, I saw those things you said about me on TV. <laughs> but he said, I admire that you, that you come out when I know your political consultants have told you not to do this. You'll come out and done it anyways. And it usually works for you politically. And I said, Michael, you got it all wrong. I don't do those things because it's a politically correct thing to do. I do those things because it's the right thing to do. And if it's the right thing to do, it'll come out in the long run and be beneficial to you. <laughs> It, it, and it's just having courage of your conviction. The third thing you're going to get from me is what my opponents want to marginalize me with, which I find humorous. They say the fact that I've lost some other races, I should quit. That, you know, there's no reason you should be in this race. I believe you want somebody in Washington, D.C. who's a fighter and who'll never give up. If you're going to go back to Washington, D.C. and do the right thing and fight for what's right for a country, you're going to get knocked on the ground. You're going to get beat up a little bit. You're going to lose some battles, right? right? But it's the ones that come back and they fight and they don't give up that are going to get things accomplished. And even my opponent says I'm a fighter that never gives up. They just think that's a bad thing. And then finally, what I've shown throughout my career is I work with people at first in sports and then in business to bring people together and get things done. That's how you get things done in, in a successful life, and I've shown that throughout my career. That's what you're gonna get if, if I am representing you here in Washington, D.C. You know, my dad uh, used to say, why would you want to get into politics? The people that are the most successful politics are the ones that lie the most and yeah. lie the most often. And he right. said, why do you want to be in that profession? Now think about that. Yeah. <laughs> this, representing you, our citizens here in the country, is one of the most important things for the benefit of our country. Why would you want people in office to lie about things who aren't telling you the truth? Why would you want to reward people that aren't being honest to you? Now look, at every race I've been in, I've had a run against the establishment in the Republican side and the Democrat side. And I've won more of those than I've lost. But I've, I end up losing some in the general elections primarily because I stood up for what I believed in. I, I ran races that we talked about why I would be a better candidate. And every election, the establishment spends millions of dollars. I tried to add it up the other day. It's over $15 million they spent against me lying and defaming me and saying I've done things that aren't true. I sued the first person, won, it, won the def first defamation lawsuit in the state's history against that person. And I sued the last person, and I've already won the first order by the judge in that case, too, and I'm going to win that, too. But that doesn't make up for me not being in office and having the people that lie in office. 
So when you follow this campaign and you hear things that you say, God, could that actually be true? Just go to the website. We're going to have in there all the true facts. And then say to yourself, do I want somebody in office who's making up these lies? Or do I want somebody who's there telling the truth? And I want to say two things. that I, uh, I want to dispel two statements or myths my opponent is saying in this race. I don't want to get into too much negative stuff on my opponents, but I believe I have to say two of these things, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish up and take questions. First, Dean Heller came out and opposed Donald Trump in the 2016 elections. Now, he said two weeks after I got in the race that he actually voted for him. It's the first time he ever said that. But during the campaign, he made these comments. I vehemently oppose our nominee. He said, let me be very, very clear. I do not support Donald Trump. And he said, I don't believe uh, Donald Trump is good for the people of Nevada. Furthermore, I believe if you follow the 2016 elections, the reason that GOP candidates did so poorly, actually did horrible, none of us won uh, a contested race, is because the entire GOP came out and repudiated Donald Trump. And it, it culminated on that press conference that Joe Heck and Crescent Hardy had. And Dean Heller was there supporting, if not encouraging, Joe Heck uh, at that press conference. In fact, here's a picture of that press conference with Dean Heller yeah. on stage. Yeah. Yeah. Now look, at okay. the reason I bring that up is because that leads me to the second thing that is dishonest with what Dean Heller is trying to tell people about this race. Dean Heller saying, Danny Tarkini can't win a general election and I can, so therefore you should vote for me. I find that so disingenuous. Right. When I lost my race in 2016 by 1%, the closest race anybody in Nevada had, closer than Joe Heck, closer than Donald Trump, and I lost by 1%. How many of you sit here today don't think that at least 1% of the GOP did not come out and vote because the top of the GOP elected officials said, don't vote for our candidate because I won't? Mm -hmm. So Dean Held is part of the reason I lost my race, and then he wants to use that against me, saying I can't win. And that's just false. Look, at I, again, I lost the closest race in Nevada's history against in, in Nevada the last election. They spent the most money in any race in Congress, $8.5 million. They did a character assassination against me, which I've sued the lady. I got her in court, and the judge said in the first order, the three statements she made in those attack ads were not true. They were substantially similar to the ones I wanted defamation lawsuit on already. She knew about the lawsuit so we could show malice, and I had a likelihood of success in the merits. So who, when I get to run against her in the general election, I don't have that weight of the entire GOP being against the top of the ticket. I'll be on the top of the ticket with Adam Laxalt or, 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 or Dan Schwartz. Um, we, uh, they're not going to be able to make those attack pieces against me because I got a report and we're going to be able to explain to the people who voted against me the last election, this is what a district court judge, he's also a Democrat incidentally, said about these allegations. I got a great chance of beating her in the general election. Now on the other side, I don't believe Dean Heller has any chance to win and you don't have to take my word for it. You just look at what's happened in history, okay? First, first of all, Dean Heller won his last race by 1% against the most flawed candidate that maybe ever ran in Nevada, Shelley Berkeley. 10% of the voters didn't vote for anybody, none of the above, or another candidate. So he already starts off with a small margin. But look what happened the last election. Joe Heck was winning in every single poll, and as of as high as 5% of the polls, before he had that infamous press conference. After he had that, he never led again in, in, in the race, and he lost the race. Now, Joe Heck's a doctor, he's a brigadier general, um, he never flip-flopped on issues, at least not ones that I know of, and he still lost. Well, how does Dean Heller think he's going to win as a never-Trumper if Joe Heck could win as a never-Trumper? So again, I wouldn't even be bringing these things up, but these are the things Heller is sending out uh, in his email blasts, in his um, fake um, websites they have and other things, and I think it's important for me to at least address those when I get the chance to talk to people. So that's why I brought those things up. Now, what I'd like to do, which is what these meetings should be about, I'd love to answer any questions you have about any policy positions I, I have or anything else you want to ask me. Uh, so I'll open this up. I think if you, if you look at two uh, presidents, uh, Reagan and uh, Trump, uh, there's a commonality there that's notable, and that is their ability to reach across the aisle and make a powerful argument to Democrat voters as to why conservatism was going to work for them. Uh, you know, 
Trump is just, I, I think he's president because of that. You're in a state that's kind of a microcosm of the nation where you have a lot of blue voters and maybe increasing them. So how are you going to, um, what is your plan or strategy to reach across the aisle ideologically and, and uh, convince those Democrat voters that uh, what the Democrats have been doing in recent years doesn't work so well. So how am I going to reach across the aisle to soft Democrats or independents and get them to vote for myself and maybe some others on the Republican ticket? What, I, what people don't understand is they say Donald Trump lost Nevada and he did poorly here. That's not true at all. Romney won by, lost by seven, I think McCain lost by nine, if I'm not mistaken. Trump lost by 2%, and as I just mentioned, the entire GOP established, uh, elected officials were against him. I think he overperformed. Why did he overperform? Because he was speaking out to hardworking, middle-class Americans, many of which are Democrats, uh, union workers, blue-collar workers, that are sick and tired of getting... Let me find another word for screw. Um, <laughs> yeah. Getting get get the well. short end of all there the legislation no that's passed in Washington, D.C. I talked about Obamacare. You're hearing stories about what they're doing with the, with the tax stuff. Now, you know, he spoke out to people that have been upset, um, frustrated, angry that their voices are being heard, and he's overperformed in Michigan, in, in uh, Wisconsin, and in Pennsylvania, and I believe here also. And again, I, 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 it's not just, I believe these things that Donald Trump had articulated in the America First policies and talked about them in years past, I never had that great slogan. I mean, that slogan is what gets the America First policies. Who doesn't believe, and I mean, you get a Democrat or somebody, who doesn't believe we should secure our borders and be able to protect what comes in our country? The Democrats voted on that in early 2000. They believe in that. Come on, who doesn't believe we should be out uh, fighting wars that, uh, that don't have an imminent threat to our national security? I believe Demo uh, uh, Democrats, at least reasonable ones, and independents do. So the point, to answer your question, I'm going to reach out to the same type of voter Donald Trump did with the, with the hardworking middle class Americans, and I'm going to be their voice in Washington, D.C., maybe a little bit of an echo compared to Trump's loud voice, but I'll be their support. <laughs> out, I don't even know how to express this, uh, whether it's on a small scale, whether it's on a big scale, but the communication is really lacking. Um, I don't know if it's a Democrat thing, I don't know if it's a school thing, but if you say, oh, the, the cloud is blue, uh, the sky is blue, they're saying, oh, look at the red something here. It's happening in a lot of businesses. It's happening when you try to get something done. It's happening on the internet. You can't seem to get anywhere. And it's become the norm. The art of politics. Okay, the art of politics, as my dad so well articulated a decade ago, is the people that can lie the best are the most successful. And what they do is they don't. Normally, it's not a complete black and white lie. They take a certain factor, they twist it around, and they make it look bad. I'll give you an example. When you saw that health care bill that Dean Heller came out and had a press conference, said he wouldn't go for it because they said 23 million people were going to be dropped from their health insurance policies. We later found out that 15 million of them were the ones that are forced to buy their health care, don't want it. So you're really not dropping them, you're allowing them to get off it. So there's only 8 million, but they, they manipulate the, stat, the, the stats to do that. They're doing that now with, uh, with the tax reform. You know, what's the answer for that? I mean, I, <laughs> again, I love and still do love Senator Paul Laxalt and those type of people that were statesmen. And you can sit back and you can say, gosh, John McCain, what a war hero, great guy. Mitt Romney, really a dignified person. They both got their butts kicked, right? Who wins? Donald Trump came back swinging away, punching away, and he offended a lot of people, but he, he fought back. And I think to answer your question, the only way we're gonna be successful is if we fight back, we roll up the sleeves of what, and, and that's, that's a good point. The other reason that's going to be different for me if I, when I run in this general election is I'm not going to sit back and allow these ads to come against me and not respond to them. I kept thinking, and I should say that, my campaign consultants could tell me they're not taking effect. Don't worry about it. No, you got to respond. you got to punch back harder than they did. If you learn anything from Donald Trump, you don't allow an attack to an answer. Jimmy Killian. Uh, you are from Southern Nevada, and that's fine. Uh, I spent the first five years in for, for some people, it's fine. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have no objection to where you choose to reside. In fact, it is, uh, the obstacle question, is question. the way. Um, that will become apparent. Uh, 
you know, don't think you have to take things head on. What you have to look for is uh, uh, a better way to approach a problem. That being said, uh, UNLV is probably within five, six miles of Mandalay Bay. Uh, Pete and my own heart, I'm following the progress of the legislation that's making its way through uh, by a covert process. It was amended when it came out of the House. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how the main thrust of that bill from the House is going to be set aside in the Senate. I just have a very simple question, and probably is only a yes or no, but you can expand upon it. How, with the legislation that has gone to the Senate for review uh, related to the right of all American, all American citizens to bear arms, is the legislation that's currently going to go before the Senate going to ever head off an event like the shooting at Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas? Uh, and the, first of all, that's the question that was asked of me over and over again after that shooting. I, 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 was, I, mean, I have no fear of going on MSNBC and CNN and, and stand up um, for what's right. And, and I was on MSNBC twice. And I said the same thing. I said, you know, look, at, I'll work on trying to fall, find solutions that can minimize these type of tragedies. First of all, you're not going to ever eliminate if you have some crazy people that do it. If there's a way to minimize them, but at the same time protect our Second Amendment rights, I would be open to hear uh, and discuss it, but that there, no one has mentioned one that would have stopped not only the one in Manly Bay at other places. Now, ironically, because I made that statement that I would be open to listen to anything that um, uh, would minimize these type of activities as long as we protect our Second Amendment rights, Dean Heller has sent out email blasts saying I am in favor of gun control, which again is a, such a lie. And it's one of those things that just frustrates you to death. How you can twist that around but they take the small part saying I'm open to listen to alternatives uh, and, and they leave out the last part about the Second Amendment. Look, at, you got crazy people in this country. If it wasn't the, the guns, the, the, the automatic weapons that he had, look what happened in New York with the bombs. I mean, he would have had a bomb that maybe walks in the middle of that group and blows them all up. Probably had more tragedies. Okay. So, so that's, that's not it. Yes, sir. Uh, Senator Heller has been really active with the Veterans Affairs uh, legislation. A couple dozen of them, I know we've been involved with and or authored. Uh, where do you stand on uh, taking over that? His senior status, and you can come in as a rookie. Yeah, no, he, I, and from what I hear, he's done a very good job, particularly with constituent services. He has a lady that works for him there that I've been told is just phenomenal from some of the veterans that I spoke with. And I anticipate uh, making a very strong offer for her to stay on when I become a senator. Uh, I don't think there's anybody more important in our country that deserves the best treatment, the best respect, and the best attention than people that put their lives on the line uh, every day uh, defending our country, giving us the rights to live, the right to live in this uh, free society. I did a, a piece on December 7th talking about my grandfather who was in two world war, he was in World War II and in the Korean War in the submarines and how it changed him. Uh, and he was never the same. He came back, he was distanced, he was very hard on his wife and how that affected their family. And you think this guy did so much to allow us to live in this country and these are the ramifications he had and we don't take care of he or others like him. That's the worst atrocity our country can do in my opinion. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think I heard you mention Yucca Mountain. And up north here in this room, most of the people up here are in favor of Yucca Mountain and I know the people in Pahrump are in favor of Yucca Mountain. And my good friend over here has been pushing hard and what we're really looking for is for someone up there to complete the uh, study of the feasibility of Yucca Mountain. Mr. Heller won't touch that with a 10-foot pole, even though he said in this room or in the Republican Men's Club, he'd be happy to discuss it. And then he just ignored me for four months in a row. So would you be happy to at least discuss Yucca Mountain? Look, look, look this is... You see, it's easy to say things when you're running for office here and there's no, uh, I'm, I'm in people with people that are in favor of it. It's tougher when you step out into the, the, the line of, of gunfire and willing to do so. In 2010, every single elected official in, in Nevada had fought everything they, they could to stop Yucca Mountain. I was running the U.S. Senate seat in the primary against Harry Reid, but I was in the primary. I came out and I was said, I'm in favor of Yucca Mountain want to turn it into a reprocessing facility like, facility like they do uh, in, in many of the countries overseas, particularly in France. 
And I came out and said, and I was told again, you're gonna lose a Las Vegas vote, it's not the right thing to do politically. But again, to me, it isn't the politically right thing to do that's important if you wanna be in public service, is to do the right thing to help your country and community. Let me go. just throw some. Thirteen trillion dollars away in there. Yeah, this, I mean, I, I can go with that. Now, let me just throw this up. First, first of all, I'm going to talk about Yucca Mountain. When we all are about to lay flat on our backs and put, they're going to put us in the ground, the awards you won, the money that you earned, uh, the titles that you had, what, 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 what good are they? There's nothing. The only positive thing you have when you are taking your last breath on, on the face of this earth is a positive impact you had for people in your community, your state, and your country. That should be the primary purpose. And if that's what motivates people to run for public office, we'd have great public servants. It's the ones that want to run there so they can have the prestige and power and will do whatever it takes to maintain that there. Okay, yuck them out. I'm just going to give you my tidbits. $89 billion project. To put that in perspective, that's about 42 times as much as it costs to build the Wynn Hotel. That's the kind of construction project you're going to have. Then you're going to have the money comes from reprocessing the nuclear spent fuel. And how much did you say that was worth right now? $13 trillion. 13 with a T. Okay, so $13 trillion of an asset that we could reprocess and sell, we'd have that. We turned Yucca Mountain area into a, uh, a research de development of all alternative energies, if you want, not just a nuclear power, but it would be the world-class place in the whole, it would be the, the best research and development of energy in the whole world here. It would make UNLV and UNR in, uh, uh, universities off the charts. Uh, and, and the risk is very minimal. I mean, they talk about transporting it in. There hasn't been an accident of transporting nuclear spent fuel in decades, and we've been doing it for, what, 30, 40 years now. Uh, the arguments against it is this. The federal government forced Nevada to take it in the late 80s, so the elected officials, Dean Heller was one in the early 90s, Sandoval was one. Uh, they all said, no, we're not gonna do this. And Harry Reid was one. They're trying to screw us, so we're gonna try to fight back and stop it. Well, quite frankly, we're gonna lose even if we don't want, if we, if we really don't want it, we're gonna lose anyways, and they're gonna stick it to us, and they'll stick it to us under their terms. Why don't we try to get our terms? We want a reprocessing facility. We reprocess and not just store it. It'll, it'll be the biggest uh, economic boost the state's ever had. You talk about being able to fund education, being able to fund health care. We won't have to have middle class Americans like us paying two th You know what, I paid $480 a month for my health insurance before Obamacare. This year it's $1,840. $1,000 deductible before, $5,000 now. You won't have these problems. You can, you can have your amount pay for all these things. They can fund K2. You don't have to have the largest tax increase in state's history. This is the right thing to do. A topic on everybody's mind is education, and we're constantly hearing how Nevada is in the dumps for education. And it wasn't that many years ago when we had a wonderful education system in the United States. California was known for good schools, New York, Nevada. And then the teachers came along with their unions, and things started to go awry. Um, the answer at that point became, well, how do we fix this? How, how do we change things? How do we make it better? And it was a typical government answer. Well, we got to spend more money. We're not spending enough money. Well, we tried that. And all it did was fatten a bunch of union bureaucrats' salaries and pocketbooks and increase donations to the party, which has a blue label. Uh, it's largely a local problem, but I see in your brochure that you'd like to do something about education at the federal level. What can you do that will change education in Nevada, in California, in New York, in Illinois, in the country? One of the things we learned through history of our country is every time we create more competition, we get a better product at a lower cost, right? We have a public school system where all the tax dollars are going to one institution. If we allow school choice and you allow people to use money that they're already paying in taxes to come back to the individual family, let them pick and choose what schools they want to go to, you're going to create more private schools that are better, you're going to create more ch charter schools. Maybe some of the parents want 